each other, to love God, to love each other, to pray, to testify. Today is going to be an unusual service. We normally start off our service with prayer, which we believe in prayer as our contact with heaven so that we can have God bless us and lead us. We believe in the preaching of the word. We believe in testimonies. We believe in giving of offerings. But today our focus is going to be on prayer and commitment. So our service is going to be short and bit because we're going to have some prayer right now in the beginning. And I'm going to ask three people from the congregation to pray. And then I'm going to close this out. Just pray out loud. And here's what you're praying for. You're praying that God's Holy Spirit would be with Tiger Covenant Church. And the glory of the Lord would be in this house. You're praying not only for this house, but for houses of worship all over the land, all over Oregon, all over Tiger, and all around the world. We're praying that God's Spirit would move among the church worldwide. And we would have the visitation of God. You're praying for healing in our minds. Alright, so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to open in prayer, and then we're going to be praying throughout the service. During my sermon, my sermon will be abbreviated this morning, and we're going to have a time of committing to God, and we're going to have some prayer at the end of service. So today's service is about prayer and commitment and having a visitation of God. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalms that remain standing. Psalms 37. Psalms 37. Psalms 37, verse 3. And if you don't have a Bible, grab one. We'd like you to follow along with the sermon. It's not going to be a long sermon. It's going to be a short one today because today is Commitment Sunday. Today is Prayer Sunday. Excuse me. We're praying and we're committing our lives to Jesus Christ. Psalms 37 3 reads this Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him and He will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret when men succeed in their ways when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It only leads to evil. The word of the Lord. Lord, we ask that you bless your word that has been read this morning, that we receive from heaven what you have for us today. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I'm just going to speak to you for uh, a brief few moments, and the sermon is going to be broken down into two parts. It's going to be part one and part two. Part one is going to deal with the first part of verse three, which says, trust in the Lord. So I'm going to speak to you for about 10 minutes on the subject of trusting in God. What does it mean to trust in the Lord? And then the second part of the sermon, part 2, is going to be the second part of verse 3. It says, trust in the Lord. And the second part of verse 3 says, and do good. And we're going to be talking about as a congregation, what does it mean for us to do good? What does it mean for us to embrace doing good works for God? And we're going to commit and we're going to end our time with prayer. And I'm going to ask the whole church join me up here and we're going to have a time at the altar and we're going to be praying and we're going to be committing uh, before God. So part one, trust in the Lord. The scripture says for us to trust in the Lord. Now the word trust has an element of faith in it. Trust is not something that we take lightly. It's not something that we just jump into casually. But trusting God, trusting in the Lord is a very, very serious matter. Now the word trust is defined as reliance on the integrity strength of another person. So we're relying on God's integrity, on God's uh, God's strength, and we in essence are putting our faith in God. We're putting everything that we have as a congregation into the Lord. Now notice the scripture says to trust in the Lord and it says and to do good. And before I get into the second part, I just want to put a framework for the whole chapter. And the chapter is giving us a contrast between the person that lives righteously and the person who lives an evil lifestyle. Notice what it says in verse 1. It says, do not fret because of evil men or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither, and like green plants, they will soon die. But then notice what it says about the person who's righteous. Verse 6, he will make your righteousness shine like the dawn. So on the one hand, we have this contrast between a person who's good and a person who's bad. On the one hand, we have this contrast between someone who's following God, and on the other hand, someone who essentially is following the ways of the world and even the devil. And so the psalmist here has given us a 
stark contrast between what's going to happen to the people that are good and what's going to happen to the people that are bad. And notice in Christianity, we have embraced this element of trusting God and we've embraced this element historically of believing in Him, but our belief in God has not always coincided with our good works. And in order for us to truly be good, to truly be righteous people, we have to have both. We have to trust in God on the one hand, and we have to do good works on the other hand. And in this chapter, David is making this contrast between those who really trust God and those who don't. And I would submit to you that the people who truly trust God are people that are also going to do good works. See, in the history of Christianity, we have had our theology, our belief in God. We've had our practices, our liturgy, the things that we say we believe in, the Apostles' Creed, and all those things uh, leading someone to the Lord and the essentials of Christianity. We've articulated that in Western Christianity for years and years. And so we've told people the way of salvation. But there have been times that we've been so heavenly minded that we have not cared about the needs of the people that are in the community. And then there have also been times in Christianity and the history of the church where we've been so enmeshed in feeding the poor and so, uh, so involved in helping people that have had social issues that we've walked away from our true faith and our true commitment to God. And what I want to submit to you this morning in the brief few minutes that I have left is that we as a type of covenant church family are going to embrace the totality of serving God, the totality of the gospel, that we are going to receive the full counsel of God and we are going to be righteous and holy people that love our neighbor. Let the church say amen. amen. So the scripture says, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. It has an element, trust has an element of faith. Faith is the trustful human response to God's self-revelation through his word and his actions. So the element of trusting God means that we have to have a true faith. And once we have that true faith, then yes, we will want to do good works. Now look at the, look at verse uh, 3. It says, trust in the Lord and do good, dwell in the land, and enjoy safe pasture. When you and I trust God, God will lead us to his pasture. God will lead us to the areas and the environments and the places where you can be blessed because you're trusting in God. See, when we get our eyes off of God and we trust the enemy and we trust the world, we'll find ourselves grazing or feeding or going to places or doing things that are not of God and before we know it, we're off course and we're doing things that are not righteous. And in order for us to truly be in love with Jesus, we have to have a trust that backs it up with proper action so that we stay in the house of God. Instead of being in church on Sunday, some folk are out doing other things. Instead of coming to the house of God and having a time of prayer, some folks are out at the casino. And God wants us to remember to have our priorities in place. And if we trust in the Lord, we are going to enjoy safe passage and we're going to graze in the proper pen. Let the church say amen. And then it says to trust in God. And in verse 4 it says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord. Delight means a high degree of enjoyment. When you delight God, that means that you have passion to God. When you delight in God, that means you are going to fully embrace coming to church and being attentive, looking at the Word of God, ready to receive the Word of God. You're not coming to Word with a kind of a, a half-baked attitude and a kind of a lazy frame of mind and just kind of go on your way casually. But when you come to the house of God because you delight in God, you're sitting forward in your chair. You're writing down notes. You're seeing how you can apply the sermon in your life. And you're asking God to even move in your heart that day so that you can have a good meal with your family, so that you can have a good opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ because you're delighting in the presence of God. You in earnest are in church and you're believing that God is going to heal that friend of yours or that neighbor of yours that you know has an earnest problem that you're concerned about. And so you're coming to the house of God to ask the Almighty God in, 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 in His wisdom and in His love that He would care for the people around you that are suffering and that are hurting because you're delighting in God. You know that He's the source of all truth and that He's the great physician. And so you're delighting in God. You know, the worst thing in the world is that we can come before the Almighty God and we just have a home. We just have a oh well, I'm just a little bit, I'm just God tomorrow. Or we come to God in our depression. Or we come to God in our sadness. And sometimes that is a part of the Christian experience that God wants us to come as we are. But I'm talking about as a practice and as a habit, as we come to God in an attitude of delighting as opposed to coming.
coming to God with a whole hum attitude and a very casual way of looking at God. And so I want you this morning to energize your mind by saying, Lord, I delight in you and I have a passion to serve you. Delight yourself in the Lord. And it says, if you do so, he will give you the desires of your heart. I mean, one of the desires of your heart. Amen. I want my prayers answered. I want God to do something rich. I want God to move in my life, and I'm waiting on him to do so. And then verse 5 means to give it all that you've got. Commit means to give in trust or to give in charge or to even take it over to God and forget about it. You know, just come to God, put it in his hands, and you've committed to him because you know that he's going to handle it. When you commit your money to, to U.S. Bank or to Wells Fargo Bank, you put it in the bank and you don't keep going back to the bank every day to make sure that money is there. You go and put it in the bank and you forget about it. Go on your business. And when you and I commit to God, we got to say that we've given it to God. We've given that problem to God. We've given that spouse to God. We've given that husband or wife to God. We've given that child to God. We've committed it to the Lord. The justice of your cause, like the noonday sun. And then this last verse, and I'm going to wrap it up. It's so beautiful. It says, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. You know, so often when we come before God, we have this long, long list. It's good to intercede. It's good to petition God. It's good to ask God for things. But sometimes we get into a habit of only asking God for things, and we don't praise him. How much time do we spend praising God, and how much time do we spend asking God for things? You notice how sometimes that's out of balance, because we have this, and we have this, and we have this, and we haven't yet said thank you. And we haven't yet said, Lord, I love you. And we haven't said, yet, Lord, I appreciate you so much. But we come to God asking and asking and asking, and God wants us sometimes to just be at rest and to commit to him and to delight in him and to wait on him and then finally and to listen to him. And so the question this morning is, are you listening? Jesus said these wonderful words in one of the gospel writings. He said, my sheep hear my voice. Are you listening to your master's voice? Do you know when he tells you to go? And do you know when he tells you to stand still? Do you know when he tells you to go forward? And do you know when he tells you to go back? Are you committed to the Lord? Are you resting before the Lord? Are you being still before Him? How many days, how many minutes during the day, right? How many minutes during the day do you turn off the TV? Turn off the cell phone? Let's see, is your phone off right now? Is your juice on it right now? Is it on vibrate? How about your iPod? How about your iTunes? How about your Facebook? You tweet? Do we turn all that stuff off and just give it a rest and just wait before we go in silence? Sometimes silence is a public person. When we just silent before God, we get more comfortable. Because we're waiting and we're wondering and we want the skies to open up and we want an answer. Because we are impatient. But when we can just wait on God and say, God, if you choose to heal me or not, I'm going to be all right.